what's the magic question to unlock somebody's soul? There is no one question because everybody's soul is different. There's no like, this is the perfect way to prepare for interviewing Robert Downey Jr., Tony Hawk, Kevin Hart, Leonardo DiCaprio, or even your idol, Muhammad Ali. Esquire magazine sends you to some random address in Beverly Hills. He comes out and I still really have no idea who he is. Just send me over to talk to a guy named Jerry. Love the journey you're taking me on. There is a copy of Esquire and he's looking at me saying, I'm gonna be on the same cover that Make Fox is on. And I said, oh shit, this is a cover story. Why do so many people get interviewing or even question asking wrong? I think the biggest problem is that most people don't like to listen. It's, it's pretty sad. You know, look, you, you ever in a conversation where you see somebody's talking and maybe there are three or four people around listening and in that three or four people, there'll be maybe three, but there'll be one person that you could look at their face and they are just waiting for the pause so that they can jump in and say what they want to say. They're thinking about what they want to say and they're waiting. Pause comes, boom, they're in. How much they were really listening, we don't know. And so therein lies the problem because here's the thing about questions. I found that it's quite often not the first question that really gets to the heart of where you want to go. It's the follow-up questions. Could be the second, the third. And so you got to be listening to the answer to the first in order to ask the right second question. And you got to be listening to the answer to the second question in order to ask the third question. And then there is your nugget of gold. So think of it this way. Think of it as digging for gold, right? Mm -hmm. And you put your shovel in the ground, you scoop out some dirt, and there's no dirt there. You can move over a couple of feet to your right and say, all right, I'll try here. And put in a different question. Scoop out the dirt. Oh, there's no nugget here. And then you can move three feet over and put your shovel in again and scoop out dirt and there's nothing there. Three different questions, three different types of questions. Whereas if you put your shovel in one place and you're carefully listening, then your next shovel load goes in the same place, only deeper. Hmm. And then by the third shovel, load, you may see a little gold there. And then you can just keep going deeper and deeper till you find a big nugget. Or there may not be much there, and then you could go to a different direction. But it all really comes down to listening because follow-up questions are the key. That is so interesting. I have found that often when people are getting started, and I found this in myself, that I'm proactively afraid to ask the question because I don't want to offend the person. I don't want to make them uncomfortable. I don't want to bully them. I don't want to ask the question. And so I would tiptoe around or sidestep. And for whatever reason, over the last number of years, maybe I'm more comfortable with it. I am fine sitting in the silence. I'm fine asking the same question a second or a third or a fourth time. I have found that very rarely will I ask a question that people aren't willing to answer. And I've also found that if I ask a question and they don't answer it, I could just say, that's awesome. But this was the question I asked you and you just circle around. Are those all things that come with experience and maturity in interviewing and you found that yourself? Or do you take a much more casual approach even to it? Everybody does it their own way or should do it their own way. There's no like, this is the perfect way to prepare for interviewing, you know, like a Russian leader. <laughs> no, you know what? I can recall is actually a photographer who went to interview Vladimir Putin. And he only had a few minutes, not to interview him, but to 
photograph them. But obviously, there's going to be some bad nage back and forth. You got to make the subject feel comfortable. This is many years ago. Yeah, because it must be because today he would have to have a very long telephoto lens because that man won't let anyone hear him. <laughs> yeah, different time. But a photographer got into a little back and forth with him and he asked, what's your favorite Beatles song? Back in the USSR, it's got to be that one. Well, Putin didn't say that, but the photographer said back in the USSR and Putin kind of like wise guy, huh? And it's probably like Blackbird, actually. (laughs) But it enabled him to loosen up for a minute. And if the photographer had five or 10 minutes, he got what he wanted. I did think it was for Time magazine. So there's just a, a case where you want to make the person feel comfortable and safe. I mean, That is pretty well, if you're looking for rules, that's rule number one, safety. Because if you make the person feel uncomfortable, they're just going to cross their arms and they're just, in my experience, not wanted to to bulge very much. Now, I don't know if you've done any like watching of old school interviewers like Mike Wallace, who made it big name for himself even before he was on 60 Minutes. But on 60 Minutes, you knew he was going in there to try to undress somebody in front of the whole country. And he had a style that really worked perfectly because for some reason, people sat in the seat and took the heat of his questions. And you you can almost at times see the beads of sweat coming down their brow. Yeah. That style only works for a few people. And I just don't know how it worked now because people would not go on that interview if they thought that there was going to be beads of sweat coming down their brow. You know, because like Ron DeSantis doesn't go on MSNBC If he wants to speak, he's conservative, he'll go to Fox. So that kind of interviewer has seen its day. I love going back to his old clips from Dick Cavett. And I don't know if his style would work today or not, but it was interesting how this late night show could have pretty dry conversations, pretty to the point. I know people were there to learn, I suppose, but mostly uh, it wasn't quite as funny as all the other stuff out there. Yeah, I agree. And it was a place where you saw Muhammad Ali and you knew you were going to get to see a different side of Muhammad Ali because Dick Cavett was a different kind of interviewer, which like gets back to the point of your question. A lot of people say, should I watch Oprah? Should I watch Barbara Walters? Should I watch Larry King? As if, should I be them? And Look, it's okay and it's recommendable to watch what you can and observe, see what works, see what you like. But ultimately, you have to transfer what you take in and mix it with your experience and then put it out through your own persona, which to your point is what happens with experience. And that's why you're so comfortable now. And so if we go back in your career, you were a professional journalist, an award-winning journalist. You made a name with this great column, and and certainly before that, but uh, with Esquire magazine, you've had the chance to sit down with some, again, the world's most remarkable people. And I understand that you go into an interview looking to dig into, there's this person who's done amazing things. So what have they done? And how did they get to where they are? And what makes them tick? And where are they going? When you approach an interview, are you just looking for these high level types of themes? Ever it goes is kind of the magic of the moment. Or do you do a lot of prep and a lot of research and have a full plan worked out in your head? Yeah, it's never the same. And because then it would get boring, right? <laughs> well, like if you're going to like sit down with Mikhail Gorbachev, like you better know who he is, what's happened in his life, 
And on the other hand, I remember this actor, Gerard Butler. Oh, yeah. Okay. And like the star of 30. Esquire magazine knew that I wasn't like a big pop culture guy. And even though he had been in that movie and a star, they thought, you know what? Cal's not going to know who he is. If we call him up and say, we want you to go interview a guy named Jerry. (laughs) Don't give him any details and say, look, just go along with it. Just sit down with Jerry for 15 minutes and tell us what happens. And is this at a press junket you would just show up for? No, no. Basically, basically it's like, show up. Here's his address. Go (laughs) meet this guy named Jerry. And then, of course, I arrive at his house and it's got one of these doors that looks like it should be set in the middle of a great European city. It's like 400 years old. So you're like, hold on, is this Jerry Bruckheimer? Is this <laughs> like, are you going through all your head, all the Jerry's that could live in the area? I have no idea. And they made it so unassuming by saying it's a guy named Jerry and that it was only going to be 15 minutes. That my, I was just very relaxed. So, but when I looked at the door, I thought, oh, okay, something's going on here. And so I knock on the door and uh, an assistant comes out and I says, like, Jerry here. <laughs> what look did she give you in that moment? Or he? Uh, like, well, I just, I says, Jerry here. And she knew I was coming. Okay. Because that's where I had set this up with her. <laughs> they expected me. I was the one who had no no expectations, right? And so Jerry Butler comes out and I said... Sorry, does Gerard Butler go by Jerry or is this just... uh, Like, do his friends call him Jerry? Well, I guess that was part of the ruse to just get me off the scent. I'll I'll call him Gerard now, but he's always Jerry. (laughs) So... He comes out and I still really have no idea who he is. And I say to him, uh, have you got a good sense of humor? And he said, yeah, pretty good. And I said, well, that's good because I have no idea who the hell you are. (laughs) Just sent me over to talk to a guy named Jerry for 15 minutes. Like, I have no idea what's about to happen. But and then I told him that this is very in my wheelhouse because when I was young and I started to travel, I would go to bus stations and train stations and just ask where the next destination was and buy a ticket to it. Because it didn't matter to me where it was going. I didn't want to know where it was going. What mattered to me was the trip down the aisle. I'm walking down that aisle and you have to understand that I don't have at that point very much money. In fact, very little money. And so I'm walking down this aisle looking for an empty seat next to somebody that looks like I can trust. Somebody who looks like they'll trust me because I'm going to pick just that right empty seat. Sit down. Train's going to get rolling. And a little while conversation is going to start, even if we don't understand the same language. and. By the end of this trip, by the end of this conversation, I need this person to invite me home because otherwise I got no roof over my head and I don't have enough money to spend in hotels like night after night. So I'm trying to prolong this trip. Yeah. So let me tell you how seriously I took this trip down the aisle. Just say there's a beautiful woman next to an empty seat. And she's smiling right at me. I look down. She's got no rings on her fingers. She could be a supermodel. And I just walked right on by. Because let's face it, there was no way she was taking me home. (laughs) But that 83-year-old Hungarian grandma in the back, that toothless Hungarian grandma eating crackers out of the bottom of her purse, she could be the winner. And... If you can imagine, I get to the back of the train, sit down next to grandma, train starts rolling, and I turn next to her, turn to her and say, what makes a great goulash? She doesn't speak English. 
I don't know much Hungarian. We're going back and forth, goulash. And, but the beauty of this time was it was before the Berlin Wall came down, before the Iron Curtain came down. And so there were always young people around who wanted to learn English. They were studying English and they didn't have many much contact with English speakers. So they were attracted to me like metal filings to a magnet. And they'd come running over and they say to grandma, he wants to know what makes a great goulash. And now you see grandma's chest swell. I'll tell him what makes a great goulash. She's talking about her grandmother's goulash, her mother's goulash, the time, the care, the love, the ingredients that she puts in her goulash. Then she turns to these young people and says, you know, I've seen you on this train before and never has one of you come up and asked about my goulash. But this young man comes from thousands of kilometers away to find out about my goulash. You tell him he's coming home with me and he's going to taste my goulash. So stop at her hometown. We go out. And next night, and I mean, she's in high gear. She's calling her friends, neighbors, relatives. They're all sitting around me the next night. I'm at the head of the table while grandma puts her goulash down in front of me. First time I'm ever going to taste it. I lift it up to my lips. My eyes close. Smile of rapture lifts my cheeks. The crowd goes wild. He loves grandma's goulash. Five-day party starts. During which time another guy comes over to me and says, have you ever by any chance tasted homemade apricot brandy? Because my father, he makes the best homemade apricot brandy you're ever going to taste. He lives about 45 minutes from here. You got to come with me to taste his apricot brandy. Okay, I said, we go to taste the apricot brandy. Another party breaks out this time, four days, in which time another guy comes over to me and says, have you ever visited the paprika capital of the world, Seged, Hungary? No, you cannot leave Hungary as my guest without visiting Seged. Okay. And that's basically how I traveled around the world for 10 years without a home. I was going to ask, because I, I know you spent a lot of time traveling. And I was going to ask, is this how you can magically afford to do it for 10 years? <laughs> that's how I did it. That's how I did it. And so... When I walked in to see Jerry, that is implanted in me. It's like, let's just sit down. And in my mind, it's like, okay, we're on the train. I know you were on Fisher's podcast, and uh, I believe you guys are friends. And I know that he loved to practice his comedy by riding the subway in New York. And he would just like walk onto the subway, start randomly doing comedy to no one who's there to listen to it, no one who cares. But that forced uncomfortableness helped him expand his comfort zone and helped him get over the nerves of a crowd and all of that other stuff. I mean, when you were going into your 10 years of travel, did you know that this was preparing you for the future ahead? Or is this just literally like, I'm doing this now? And then suddenly later, you're like, oh, yeah. Talking to grandma on the train really paid off because now I can walk into Jerry Butler's house, Gerard Butler's house, and not worry about having a 15-minute talk with him. And here's the thing. He's looking at me. Saying, like, you're shitting me. Like, <laughs> somebody put you up to this. I, said, I, I have no idea who you are. So he sits down because, like, by that time, I know that we're going to take a train ride together. And basically, the train ride takes us back to his home in Scotland. And he starts telling me about how he grew up. And it's only, I would say, 15 minutes in conversation when it, he starts to become an actor. I said, oh, so you became an actor. And then he looks at me like, this is so full of shit. Like, you are setting me it's, up. It's so high risk because he could just be offended. He could just be like, you are wasting my time. <laughs> but he went along with it. And... There was, came a moment where the whole thing got turned upside down on me because I basically asked, is there a bathroom I could use? Because it was more than 15 minutes. It's like an hour or so in. And he said, yeah, let me take you over to the one by my room. And as we're going to the bathroom, 
there is a copy of Esquire on his like, Euro with, oh, what was the actress? Her name, last name was Fox. Megan, Megan Fox? Megan Fox is like, really beautiful. It's one who was in uh, Transformers. Yeah, Megan Fox. Megan Fox. Okay, so Megan yeah. Fox is on the cover. And then he said, like, can you believe, I, like, it's hard for me to believe that I'm going to be on the same cover that like Megan Fox is on. And I said, oh, shit, this is a cover story. <laughs> oh, they didn't tell you. I had no idea. I had no idea. And then the fate of the moment that Esquire had in that issue, like the 300 movies that every man should see. And so he said, like, I know that you really know who I am. Because I know that you know me from the movie 30. And I said, I, that movie 30, I like, oh, I think I once saw a poster of that movie. There's this guy with a like a, a warrior with a beard. And he says, I was the guy with the beard. <laughs> so he's trying to convince me that he's like a well-known actor. And sorry, when you mean the movie 30, you mean the movie 300? Oh, 300. I'm sorry. Jeez. I'm there, it shows how well you know, Jerry. <laughs> I blew it, man. Why did I say 30? What's in my mind? I, I was thinking like 30, 30? going on, 29, go, you know, 15 going on 30. I was trying to figure out, was he in a love story? 300. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I haven't told this story in a while. 300. I, I love it. So he's saying, okay, look, I guarantee you the movie 300 is one it was the 75 movies that every man should see. 300 is on this list. And so he opens the magazine. He looks at page one. He says, oh, there's some really good movies in there. And then he goes to page two because he's waiting to see 300. It's not there. He gets to page three and it's like, shit. Go to page four. Shit. Fuck. He gets to the end and it's not there. And the interview is him basically trying to convince me that he is like the guy that's going to be on that the cover of Esquire. That he's worthy. <laughs> yeah. And so then he says, well, I was a phantom in Phantom of the Opera. And then I just like burst into laughter. I just said, you can't sing. And he's saying like, you're right, I couldn't sing. But then he tried to explain all the things he had to go through in order to master this role and he starts going through all the other movies and I'm like becoming very curious and a lot of funny things happen where and that happens it just flips him upside down so it doesn't seem like he's the celebrity or you, you, you might even wonder if you're watching this on a documentary if this guy is really the movie star <laughs> and then the interview wraps up it's been a great time. He actually invited me to come over and use his movie room and, you know, watch whatever movies that I wanted. And so it was very much like a trip on the bus. I, people just took me in their homes. And then just before I walk out the door through the whole house, the music of him singing on Phantom of the Opera reverberate. <laughs> he, he throws on the soundtrack. It's like, this is me, this is who I am. So there's an example of finding out who somebody is without even knowing their full name. If I can just ask one pointed question. Let's say that you walk in there and he says, excuse me for a second. And then he gets his agent on the phone. He gets his manager on the phone. He gets the editor-in-chief of Esquire on the phone and goes, what the fuck are you guys doing sending me someone who doesn't even know anything about me and wasting my time? And then shows back up to you and goes, okay, you got 12 minutes, go. <laughs> I mean, does that happen? Or, and how do you handle it if it does? It's never happened. So I It's don't, never happened. People don't get that offended. Here, you know, that you asked about questions, okay? This is what people don't understand about questions. Yeah, like people are always saying, what's the magic question to unlock somebody's soul? And there is no one question because everybody's soul is different. So everybody's got a different lock and there's a different key to every person. But let's just say there was one master key. It would still mess people up. 
because you could ask that question at the wrong time. It's just like you were saying in the beginning of the interview that when you started out, you were a little antsy about asking a direct question that might make them uncomfortable. But if you warm them up for 45 minutes and they were completely comfortable, you could ask that question without any problem. So the placement of the question is crucial. Not only that, but your tone of voice when you ask it. You can ask the question with the wrong tone of voice. I'll give you the best example. I was sitting at a table doing kind of a master class and asking questions to a bunch of CEOs. And this CEO gets really perturbed and he finally just stands up and says, like, I don't get it. I ask the same questions that you do, and I never get the answers you do. And I said, well, I kind of have an idea why. Because his tone of voice and the way he delivered it didn't make people comfortable to give him the same answer. So to your point, a lot of it is the experience of watching people become comfortable when you ask questions. I'm sure you have asked questions and you thought, ah, that didn't go too well. Either I won't ask that at this point or maybe I'll never ask that again. And there are other times where you ask a question, you got a home run. And then you say, oh, I'm gonna come back with that again. So experience, an answer to your question, which I think you asked like a half an hour ago. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. I love, love the journey you're taking me on. I really apologize about the 300. I, sh- I should have... I'm trying to think why I would I, think... I, I think that makes the story even better. You know, you're telling this story about how you're like, I, don't, I haven't seen the movie. I think I saw a poster. I don't even know who you are. You know what? It's been 20 years or something. We got the movie wrong. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> You know what? When I tell the story next time, I may just use 30 just to see everybody's reaction. (laughs) And see, I was just politely going along going like, I'm not sure I know that movie. And I'm behind the scenes pulling up IMDb and I'm looking for this movie 30 so I can like maybe, did I see it? I don't know if I saw it. I'm going to admit something to you. I've never seen 300. Oh, Um, it's really a great movie and you should go see it. And, And not only that, Gerard Butler is fantastic in it. Well, I know that you are connected uh, with the guy from Spartan Races. Uh, I got fit a few years ago. I I saw a picture of you running it. I've started doing Spartan Races. I want to get competitive. And they're at the beginning, you know, of each race. And they're like, I'm Spartan. I'm Spartan. And I'm kind of looking left and right going like, I don't know anything about Spartan. (laughs) (laughs) Holy cow. You went to the races without seeing the movie. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, early on when I started this podcast, I had a, one of the professional Spartan racers on, Ashley Hiller. Uh, and I was so inspired by what she was doing where I was like, obstacle racing sounds cool. So when it came time for me to just like try something, it was the only brand I knew. <laughs> so it was like, it was just marketing at work. I just was like, I'm going to try something. I'm going to do a Spartan race. And I love them. I'm like so hooked now. It's amazing. So you were attracted. Again, you know, that's an interesting thought that a marketer would be attracted to the marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How interesting that I'm filtering all of my conversations through that lens, isn't it? Well, you know, the other thing is everything you know about marketing might give you the advantage of saying, oh man, that's a load of crap. And Spartan is great. Not that I would even use those words to in the same sentence. Just that you know what goes on behind the curtain. And so you probably can figure out when things might be a little misleading or just putting out a big hook for people. (laughs) When you have that skill, does it come with a fascination for when something is done well, you just say, I'm in. Wherever this hook has taken me, I'm going to bite. I just have to point out, I love how you flipped the conversation now. Uh, so it, it does a few things. And I think this is the same with anyone who has any kind of profession. You know, 
I went to film school and people could not watch movies with me because uh, they can't watch reality TV. I, I became a professional editor. I can hear every edit of every soundbite. I could hear when, you know, when Don, uh, Donald Trump was on The Apprentice. And I remember being in television and the host of a TV show I was working with said, oh, Donald Trump said this during this session. This is why this person's fired. I said, went to voiceover. You could hear it was a pickup. You could hear it was scripted by producers. In the live episode, you could see how inarticulate he is compared to how articulate he is when he's scripted. It wasn't him at all saying that in the moment. It was totally... like (laughs) It ruins everything when you know what's happening. And so to your point with marketing, I can very much become very cynical about stuff that's just uh, greenwashing. You know, the environment was a big deal. So 20 years ago, 15 years ago, everything became green. And especially within products. But I very much appreciate when brands give a great experience. And it bothers me so much when brands give a poor experience or don't live up to the promises that they're making. Simply because that's, to me, like, it's just table stakes, right? You make a promise, you live up to it in some way. So that's what it's done for me. It's ruined everything. (laughs) Well, you know, it sounds like it's created a magnificent filter for you to be able to choose where you're going to go head first with or into. And then once you make that step, it almost becomes on them to go over the bar. Yeah, but my wife gets upset because I... So for example, I'm going to flip the conversation a little bit on you. So I know you became friends with the late Larry King, one of my heroes that I look up to. I know that you guys have breakfast together. I have to imagine that as conversation after conversation goes by, you guys can get like more direct with each other. You could probably analyze what's going on and just get straight to the actual... uh, like The analysis, the behind the scenes professional analysis of what's happening. And you don't need to hedge. You don't need to fluff it up. You don't need to make it polite. You can just get straight to the point. And I get that way when it comes to businesses. And so if I'm in a restaurant and someone is giving me poor service, I cannot help but become extremely direct with them. Because now it's not a question of me as a customer or what have you. It's now getting to the root of the business. And I just want to like go talk to the manager and like figure this out with them. And so my wife gets very uncomfortable because I get super direct because all of the niceties fall away. And now I'm just a marketing, a business development entrepreneur wanting whatever business I'm experiencing to do better because I'm paying for it. <laughs> Man, it sounds like you're much deeper than... I'm going to tell you a marketing story. You're, gonna, you're either going to love this or you're going to throw me off the podcast. Let's see what happens. And, you know, I'm, I was about to say, you sound deeper than a marketing guru. And the problem with that sentence is me. It's not you. Okay. So I'm going around the world for 10 years. I saw myself as a cross between Marco Polo and Ernest Hemingway, right? And I'm back in the United States and I get to interview Jack Welch, General Electric. This is not long after he retired after having one of the most amazing careers in business. And we sit down, we start talking and it's like right on the bus. We're having a great time. And I'm starting to tell him stories. And he is like wanting to ask me more questions. It's like this flipping going back and forth. He's wanting to ask me questions because he's fascinated I, I was in the ring with Julio Cesar Chavez, swimming over in, over in Tiger Shark. And after a while, he just says, you know what? Like, you know, once this interview is done, we're going to have to lunch. We're going to have a nice long lunch and a great conversation. And so I said, oh, that's great, Jack. And so we, the interview ends. We get up to walk out of the house. And he turns to me, puts his hand on my shoulder. And he said, Cal... If I was still at GE, there is no way you would have gotten out of these doors without joining our marketing team. And I'm looking at him like Robert De Niro. You talking to me, Jack? You talking to me? Because I don't see anybody behind me. And he obviously looks at me and understands that like he's offended me in some way. And he just started laughing. He said, Cal, I'm like, don't take it the wrong way. When I was a kid, 
we used to go to the playground after school and play baseball. And I was always the captain. I always knew who to choose, the best people to choose on my team and where they belonged, like what position they belonged in. That's what I'd done best like all my life. And I'm just telling you, could be wrong, but you belong on a marketing team. And so I literally, I went, I said, can you excuse me? I went into the bathroom and I was throwing cold water over my face. Like, did he just call me a marketer? A marketer? (laughs) Because I didn't understand like the brilliance needed to be a great marketer. I just didn't, I didn't get it. And so, you know, we went out for lunch and years later, and this goes back to the lunch with Larry King, some people had come in. I don't know if you've ever heard a group called Summit. It's a group of entrepreneurs that have members who are entrepreneurs and they bring them together so everybody could learn from one another. And when they were very young, they set up the first cruise ship where all these young entrepreneurs could get together and have a great time. And it's then grew and grew. And then they bought a mountain in Utah as their home for entrepreneurs. So anyway, they asked Larry if he would come and speak on their cruise ship. Now, I knew that Larry was never going to speak on their cruise ship because Larry was terrified of water. He didn't even like to go into showers. He went to shower just for like, 30 seconds. He was out. He was out. What a strange and, quirk. <laughs> but at the same time, Larry could never say no. So the people who had asked him were becoming friends of mine. And so he said, yeah, but I knew he's going to say no. And at the end, he said, oh, I can't make it. And then so they had me come on in his place. And you know what? The marketing on this talk was amazing because they put it out as if Mikhail Gorbachev, Donald Trump, Muhammad Ali were on the boat, (laughs) not the guy who had interviewed all these guys. And so when I show up to give this talk, I'm thinking like 13 people are going to be there because I was always under the radar. And the room is packed full of entrepreneurs. There's billionaires sitting cross legged because there's no more seats. And the crowd is just approaching me. And I just had to get up and speak. And it was like the first time I had ever spoken in public. Uh, But I was really prepared. And, you know, I got my stories. I can tell my stories. And I can link them with points. And so I get down. There's a standing ovation, long line of people to see me. And one of them is the head of Patau, which is a big marketing group. And they have a big festival many times a year. And the first people to ask me to come speak after this event was a marketing group. And I just sat there and thought, Jack, you got it again, man. (laughs) You told me about myself. I didn't know. And you want to know something else? This is wild. It translates this day because I'm doing something new. Not many people know about it, but I'm translating the way I think about questions to help people hire. Because apparently hiring is a huge problem now. Oh, yeah. And you ask people who are running companies And, you know, they'll tell you that, you know, they're lucky if they get it right 50% of the time or that, you know, I've heard some people tell me they set up interviews with people. The people don't show for the interview. They have an interview. They like the person, go through the process, hire the person. People don't show up for the first day of work. I mean, I couldn't even comprehend things like this. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking my questions to a new place. I'm going to help businesses find the right questions to ask to connect their jobs with the right people. And the beauty of it is that like right now, 
anybody can go on chat GPT and just say, okay, I'm going into this company for a job interview. What are the 20 questions I'm going to be asked? We'll probably get 20 questions. He can make, of course, she can make up 20 answers. And are you really seeing the person at all? I don't think so. And not only that, but I'm told that some of the companies are now giving like a lot of testing beforehand so that you can qualify for the actual interviews. And these tests are like done at home. So anybody can just reach out to their cousin George in Mumbai, (laughs) India, and have somebody else do the work. And so it gets to this point that so many people were telling me, basically in almost these same words, we meet somebody during the job interview process. And then the first day they show up at work, it's a different person. So what I'm going to do is allow my use of questions to bring out that real person in a way that ChatGPT is not going to know what I'm asking. It's interesting because we do a lot of work within recruitment as well. So often a few things happen. Businesses, small, medium, huge businesses, they treat it as a qualification process where if unemployment is extremely high and you have the pick of all the best talent, or if frankly, you just want people to pass the mirror test, right? Can they breathe and will it leave a little fog? on the mirror, (laughs) then frankly, it's a qualification process. But because it's such a competitive global marketplace, because there's more options for people to be self-employed and to be freelance and to be contract, because salaries have been fairly stagnant for the last 20 or 30 years, because I'm an early millennial. And so millennials and Gen Zs are entering with more debt, with fewer opportunities, with less access to wealth than ever before. Because of all of these things that are happening, Frankly, most of the work we do, at least, it's not because it's a qualification process anymore. We need to sell people on the opportunity. So we need to make promises. Sometimes marketing can help. Sometimes communications can help. Sometimes it's more like PR or even like an experience of sales and onboarding. But we as companies need to actually compete for talent. It can't be a qualification process anymore when people have the pick of the uh, litter. And on top of that, earlier I mentioned like it bothers me when people don't live up to the promises that they make. You know, it's marketing's job. It's advertising, marketing, communication. It's our job to make big promises. It's operations job to live up to those promises. (laughs) It's not marketing's job to dumb everything down, water everything down because we're too afraid to say anything. So we make big promises. That's what we should do in recruitment. On day one, a different staff member may show up but I can guarantee you the onboarding process is terrible. The different staff members showing up, it's a different company though. They like they're like they're like this is the role. Oh, this, is the role. this is the company. This is what I'm doing. Is this really worth it? So frankly, companies could pay more. They could try to sell people more. They could try to woo people and date them before they marry them. There's so many things we can do. You know what? Now I can see why and you tell your wife I have pronounced you completely sane. I see why when you go into the restaurants and you get bad service, you feel offended. Because oh, yeah, I'm offended in my core. <laughs> you're offended to your core because you've been made the big promise. And now the operations people aren't keeping it. And so I completely get that. And it's almost like you're not even offended from the customer side. You're offended from the company side. Yeah. Yeah. It's the company's fault. It's not even the staff member's fault often. You know, it's like, oh gosh, isn't it worst when something goes wrong and they say, you know, like, sorry, Uh, I was at the airport flying to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, the middle of Canada. And something was messed up in the system. And this amazing person working at the counter was just trying to make this traveler happy. And she kept apologizing that the system wouldn't allow her to make the change and because of the way the system works. And all she could do was just blame the system. And it's like, it's not that woman's fault. It's not the, it's not the traveler's fault. It's not the airport's fault. It's the airline. It's whoever built the system. It's it you're letting your staff down. You're letting your customers down. You're letting everyone down. You you know, I am very curious about you now. 
I can tell you actually love to interview. It, I do. It, it, I um, do. I, I saw a woman standing on the side of the road holding a sign saying, I have four children, please give money. And I almost wanted to like go to the bank, pull out a hundred bucks, say, here's a hundred bucks. Can I ask you a bunch of questions? <laughs> like, is this a scam? Is this real? Like, I just, it's just you and me. I'm going to pay you for your time. That's how curious I am about people. <laughs> you know, John Steinbeck, the novelist, used to pay people for their stories. I get, you know, he met a lot of hard luck people during the Grapes of Wrath days. And so you're in good company. My, my question is, like when you are interviewing somebody for a job, what's the difference between your approach and your approach now when you're interviewing me for a podcast? That is a great question because I'm actually fairly bad at interviewing people for jobs because I ask leading questions. Like, give me an example. So, so here's a great example. We're building up a sales team. And I just had this thought the other day where I said to my COO, when we interview our next person who's going to help build our sales team, I'm going to ask them, how will you sell our product? You can ask me any questions you want. I will answer them certainly, but I want to know how you think and I want to know how you will sell our product. In the past, I would explain everything about the company, everything about the product, everything about how we sell it. I would go through all the details and give them everything and then say, what do you think of it? Like, like almost like I'm spoon feeding them everything. And then all they have to do is go like, sounds good. I can do that. And then we would hire them and we would expect them to grow the role. We would expect them to grow the department. We'd expect them to come up with new ideas or systems or processes, not realizing that the questions I was asking was just getting people who could follow the process we have. But our processes suck. I want people who can invent new processes. So rather than me explain anything, I should just say, how will you sell this? I think, and then the questions they ask me will reveal how they think. I think that is a great question. And not only that, I think what you've done through experience is taken 30 to 45 minutes of time where you spent explaining and basically knocked it down into a few words that gives the applicant a chance to display who they are through their questions. Because now you're not asking them to tell you immediately how they were going to do it without getting your inside information. And if they do, I'm thinking something's wrong. This person is a know-it-all who thinks they can just come in here and tell me everything without, with, it goes back to the beginning, without listening first. If they can't listen first, well, you're probably going to have a problem. So I think your question is absolutely great. And I think it's going to set up a dialogue back and forth because now you have flipped the interview around and now they have to interview you. And through their questions, they are going to see what your company is all about, what you're all about. And look, what better way of selling, what better opportunity to sell have you got? You're going to sell them the best of your company. You're also going to admit things that, you know, weaknesses that you have. And they're going to have to respond to that in real time. And it's not some test that they could send off to their Uncle George in Mumbai to get somebody's attention. So I'm thrilled with that question. I love it. I think you're in a great place asking that question. It only took me 16 years to learn it. <laughs> <laughs> and you, let me tell you something else about the beauty of that question. I can be a candidate for that job, right? You just heard Jack Welch, Told yeah, you, yeah, you are you are an expert marketer. I would still have to be able to have the curiosity and the thought process behind the questions to get your attention. It just it's going to show you how I think, the way how I react with people, how I might react with people on the job because 
I don't know who you got working in that department. And you're going to see whether I have a sense of humor, whether I'm a good storyteller, whether I am somebody who knows funnels. And it's, that's all going to come out in the most natural conversation. I am delighted to hear that question. I have just started to go on this path. And that is like a, that is a nugget right there that I'm putting in my pocket. And uh, if I use it, I promise I will credit you every time. I have now just hit a new height in my career. I have passed <laughs> the Cal Fussman test. <laughs> there you go. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask a few questions that I'm curious about. And I'm sure you get asked these all the time, but I'm just so delighted by your stories. So I would love to know the one person that you were most surprised by and why, and the one person you were most intimidated to interview. Oh, man. I, the most surprised by was the first supermodel, Lauren Hutton. I don't know if you're familiar with that name. She is famous for having a little gap between her top two teeth. Yes. And was like the big biggest model in like the early mid 60s, but it kept going through the 70s. And she's still photographed now and she's in her 70s. And you can go look her up. You'll see she's a beautiful woman, but a beautiful person. And what you heard about how I traveled around the world for 10 years without a home, she had started in modeling back in the days where kind of the agencies worked on hourly rates. And the, if you wanted to be a model, you just followed the rules. But Lauren saw how at the time, some of the baseball players who signed contracts with baseball team, there was no free agency back then. If you signed a baseball a contract with a baseball team, they basically owned you. And you couldn't just say, I want to live and play in another city. No. If you were signed to play with the St. Louis Cardinals, you were playing for the St. Louis Cardinals. And there's no choice. But some players started to go to court against this. And she noticed what was going on. And so she made a deal with a big cosmetics company that took her out of her situation and put her in a place where she negotiated a deal where she said, you have me every day for six months, whatever you want. I'm here to work. Let's organize the shoots. When that's six months in, you will not see me for another six months. And what she would do is when the six months ended, she would get on a plane, go to the middle of Africa. Nobody had any idea where she was going, not even her. And she would show up six months later. Just to create the scarcity or what? No, she was just curious about, wow. like, it could be Africa one time. It could be Polynesia another time. She went all over the world to just, she's a very natural person. And she just was always looking at new things. And what the photographers would say was that every time she came back, she was like, her face was somehow a little different because of these experiences had put new things into her and given her like a new vibrancy. And, and I went in to see her at like, oh, it must have been like 10 in the morning. And I didn't get out till six at night. And we have become like friends and she's like a godmother to my youngest daughter. And so that was like the biggest surprise. And really, she's a, almost a generation older than me, but I really feel a, an amazing kinship with her. Are you a romantic at heart? Just watching you describe the beauty or what she would come back with. It just, it, you just sounded like such a romantic. Well, I am, I like authenticity. I love authenticity. And she, you, like you wouldn't, if I, if you think of a model, you think of somebody who's made up and posing. And yet, when you look at Lauren Hutton, there was just 
always something incredibly authentic coming out to you, starting with the fact that like they told her to close the gap in her teeth. (laughs) And she said, screw you. That's my teeth. I'm me. And that's part of the reason. I mean, it's more than the gap in the teeth. It's what's inside her saying, no, I am me. I'm not changing for you. I am going to be myself. Now, even though you can put her in with great photographers, she gets made up, but still that authenticity comes like through her skin. This is an amazing woman. You know what? I think so highly of models, actually, mostly because I was watching this show a few weeks ago only on Netflix called Next in Fashion. It's one of these reality fashion competitions where designers have to create stuff. And season two is uh, hosted by Gigi Hadid, who's uh, this woman who has become a top of the fashion. She's with Victoria's Secret. She's with all these things. But there was this little thing in passing where they had this clip of her talking to one of the contestants and she was wearing these like ridiculous shoes, like ridiculously high platform shoes in this crazy huge gown that would normally be worn to the Met Gala. And she had to walk up some stairs and over something. And the contestant turned and said, I can't believe you can walk in that. And then she just, in passing, was like, you know, this is my job, right? Like, you know that I'm trained to do this. And I do this all day. And I do this every day. And it's totally uncomfortable. Like, just in that one moment, the confidence. And then I looked into her career and I realized, oh, to be at that level, I think you have to understand not only business and not only your health and all of that stuff that goes into it, but you just have to love pushing through your comfort zones. I don't think you become at that level without this desire to just have confidence own the moment and put yourself out there. Yeah, most people don't realize like how long like a single shoot can go, what it takes out of you. And so I, I didn't mean to diminish models in any way. Every time I have met one, in fact, they have always surprised me. I'm a big boxing guy and I don't know, I'm, I'm this may go back ways, but Christy Brinkley, who was married to Billy Joel, Uptown mm-hmm. Girl, yep. on the cover of Sports Illustrated. She was a big boxing fan. And she actually would be, would get like ringside credentials to photograph the fights. And so when I went to meet her, like we spent like three hours just talking about boxing. And she was telling me things like I had no idea had happened. And here I thought like I was an aficionado of the sport, but she was like at the weigh-in, she saw things that I was a thousand miles away. And, you know, models have to see things very sharply. So her eyes were like really good. And so now that you're mentioning it, I would say almost every time I sit down with a model. I am surprised in some way. It's almost unfair, right? They got the brains and the looks and the confidence (laughs) and the talent. It's unfair. Oh, But you know what? I was just thinking next time I sit down with a model, (laughs) I need to spend more time with models, apparently. Maybe we all do. (laughs) Oh, Cal, I've, I've enjoyed our conversation so much. I have one more question for you. But before I do, what would be the best place for people to reach you? They go to calfussman.com and leave a message there. We'll always get right back to you. And I'm very interested to, to see where this conversation takes us. And when I say us, I mean, you're now, you've implanted things within me and that I'm going to step forward with on my journey to help people ask the right questions in their job interviews. So if anyone's interested in giving this a try, they can reach out to me at calfussman.com and I'm here to help. And you're also the host of Big Questions with Cal Fussman, a podcast that you can check out on all of the local audio apps like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. Okay, final question I have for you. At the end of the day, what does it all come down to? And now that's a question that 
you can get a different answer on every single day. And we've had like since COVID, you know, a lot of people that I've been friendly with have passed away. And so it just, I know it it sounds cliched, but it really does let you know. Okay, we just had this conversation. I love this conversation. It was a great conversation. And if everything for the rest of my day rises up to that same level, well, it's a good day. You are very generous and kind. Thank you so much for your time and for all of your wisdom and your great stories. There's no way I would kick you off the podcast. (laughs) Well, I hope to see you down the track somewhere because I've got a lot of questions for you. I'm an open book. You can ask away. (laughs) All right. You know what? In fact, how about you come on my podcast? (laughs) I would love to. I was leading us there the whole time. (laughs) All right. You got your wish. You (laughs) Let's set it up and you tell me when. Let's do it. Sounds amazing. Okay, listeners. So if you want to hear me on Cal's podcast, listen, just stay tuned. (laughs) 